You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. So with me, with me this afternoon on The Crunch is provocateur, former soldier, former politician even, uh, journalist, and uh, a rebel from the start, Avi Yemeni, welcome to The Crunch. Thanks for having me, mate. Good to be here. Well, you know, I've been reading your book, Avi, and it's uh, it's been a real eye opener. Um, but before we crack into some of the uh, some of the details, crunch some of those details in that book. Um, I, I just want to give listeners a, an idea about what drives you, what makes you stick cameras in people's faces, politicians, and the elites at Davos, and all of those. So, what what drives you? to get out of bed in the morning and say, right, I'm going to go and get a story here. Well, no one else is going to do it. So that's what we've learned over the last few years. I guess I started in 2017. So it's been five long years. COVID has been a big part of that. But even before COVID, what we noticed is that there's a gap in the media. If Mm. something doesn't suit the narrative, then the mainstream media are not going to run it. And uh, you know, that's where companies like Rebel News, that's where we've we've started from. We've realized that there is that gap. And you don't have to look any further than something like the Russia-Ukraine conflict. It doesn't matter which side of mm. that conflict or whether you don't you, you don't have any side. You, if you don't... It's trying to feel, report the facts. If you just want to know the facts, <laughs> well, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to get that because what journalism has done in 2023 is they've just cancelled one side. So mm. instead of sending reporters into Russia and to question uh, Putin and the Putin regime and the government or officials, what they've done is they've just demonized everyone and everything. And they've made out that the other side is just this heroic, lovely people that don't have any bad Nazis or whatever, and no oligarchs. It's just a completely, it's, it's our side against their side. And if you want to get any sort of balance view of it, well, you need to actually hear from both sides um so our job is to bring you the other side of that story and and that the side that the media doesn't want to show that's probably what drives me most is talking to the people in the places about the things that the mainstream media won't cover that's how you kind of got started isn't it when you were serving in the israeli defense forces you started making videos and and um, things for your business back in Australia, which kind of got you in front of the camera. Well, it wasn't it wasn't even much the camera back then. It was more um, so I talk about it in the book. It's more about uh, just posting on Facebook. You know, we, mm. we had we had it was when I came back from the army and we had two of two. You, you know, one of the most well known gym brands in the country because we we were. You know, we had a, a big following mm. and it was pretty high profile. So it, it was actually called IDF training. So individual diet and fitness, but also it was a Krav Maga gym. So it was, yeah. you know, trained with ex IDF members. So our whole brand was about, uh, for, you're learning Krav Maga, which is the Israeli army self-defense system. So when I saw reporting on ABC about the current conflict in Gaza and I saw how one sided and how untrue you know it was my first kind of um uh, i was it was like i was meeting fake news for the first time and seeing how they report from a a biased position you know it was like the journalists made up their mind as to what they wanted you to believe in that scenario and as somebody had actually served exactly where they were reporting from in gaza i knew that it was completely false mm-hmm. and biased the reporting and mm-hmm. we i started using our facebook pages for the business um to to voice from first-hand experience the other side of that story yeah um so yeah you're right that's how i did start and you know the rest is history well some of that history though is the the uh, collusion of the new zealand government 
immigration and the police to prevent you coming to New Zealand to cover a protest that probably only had about a thousand people at it. Uh, it was. It, it's funny because look, a lot of that is thanks to you, Cam, because that first initial uh, Interpol leak was given to you guys at um, at your at your site, and it showed clearly that the government and the police. The state was essentially uh, essentially colluding with anyone they could to try ban me before even knowing I was coming. They were colluding with the media. The, 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 you know what was funny about that whole story is that it all started with the New New Zealand Herald. New Zealand Herald, yeah, they, they are, and no byline. They're anonymous writer. Yeah. You know, but does a hit job against Davi Yemeni, pulling up all the things that are in you, that you cover in your book, you know, the Tommy Robinson quote um, about being Australia's most proudest Nazi. <laughs> you know, while you're Jewish standing Nazi. There, Jewish Nazi, yeah, we're wearing a kipper and um, standing there talking to a microphone, you know. There was a reason why they didn't have a byline to that article. Um, and But the interesting thing is, if you notice, they ran that article they ran that story back then based on a rumor from Chantelle Baker on yeah. her telegram mm -hmm. that I was coming and it was clearly designed to pressure and to help the government ban me yeah. and authorities ban me. And it worked at the time because even within the um, Interpol and the communications, with the internal communications, we saw essentially copy and paste from that article. In fact, when I was at the airport, they said... Word for word. It was word for word. Well, well, the lady on the phone, I forgot her name, but when she was giving me the news that I'm banned, she was saying she read the article and she was referring to this New Zealand Herald article. And now, though, fast forward to now, where I've personally announced I'm coming, so it's no longer a rumour. Yeah. And I'm saying they've overturned that unlawful ban created by the New Zealand Herald. Yeah. You would think that the New Zealand Herald that was so triggered by the rumor of me potentially coming. Totally uh, silent, aren't they? For for to cover an event as a journalist, are suddenly really quiet that I am coming and I'm saying I'm coming to launch my book. So not even to not even for a a to cover an event as a journalist, suddenly they're really quiet. Why do you think that is, Cam? <laughs> well, you know, this is the thing that, you know, when we released that memo and everyone, the politicians, the uh, the, the media especially, uh, people on Twitter went out of their way to try and disprove that memo. Instead of it looking at the story, hello, here we have the police deciding that they don't want someone coming to New Zealand, so they're begging the Australian Federal Police for some information to help them stop you coming. That's the story, but the media pursued, oh, the memo's fake. The people on Twitter accused me of fabricating this, this communication instead of being outraged that that immigration and police were trying to stop someone coming to New Zealand when we've had, you know, people with actually far worse records than yours come to New Zealand, Mike Tyson and people like that, you know, actual. You mean actual violent people. Actual uh, violent and, people. And, and isn't that funny, a bit like the New Zealand Herald, uh, when they didn't get their way, when it turns out that you didn't fabricate it and it turned out that it was authenticated and it was true and, in fact, the freedom of information requests that followed proved showed it. It, yeah. proved it and proved that it was far worse, far more sinister from the beginning, the entire way. Suddenly that those same people that their entire story was that you faked it. Yeah. So, and isn't it interesting that they had to, they had to say you faked it because it, it was clearly so outrageous you know, why would they care if it was real or fake if it didn't matter? It obviously mattered a lot. But then when it was authenticated, suddenly they silent. all all, Total went, silence. all went silent. Um, and that's, you know, I feel bad for them because at the end of the day, yes, this was against what they perceive as their political opponent. Mm. But they should probably read history uh, 
and learn that if uh, if you think that's good for your political opponent, just wait till it happens to you. Because if they can do it to me, they can they can and will do it to you. Just when it's that's the right. others in power. That, that's exactly right. And th- this is the thing where I believe uh, that the media in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, United States have. Have you know everyone used to mock Donald Trump because he said the media were the enemy of the people, but 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 that was kind of true because they've got their own agendas that they're pushing. You know, you've got stuff, for example, that touts themselves as New Zealand's largest news website that won't tolerate any sort of narrative that is contrary to the green way of thinking and climate change and all of that they just we you know they've even announced when we're not going to publish any contrarian views it's it's not they say it's not responsible it's not responsible but when you get media making decisions like that and what else does it apply to covid's a classic example you saw it in australia you know you were fighting it in australia anything you said would be you know censored or banned. I think, I think you guys had it far worse, to be fair. In Australia, uh, as much as the establishment tried to take me on, they failed and we grew through that entire COVID um, era. How many times did you get arrested, Darby? Uh, I, got, I got three and we won all that in court, but that's how we won. That's how yeah. we beat them. But in New Zealand, the pr- the media is – through those different funds is bought and paid for. Um, It's no secret. And you see how that plays out. My, my band is a classic example of that. And I, I often say, because I understand why the media doesn't want me there. They don't want a repeat of what's happened in Australia Mm. um, with regards to rebel news, you know, essentially taking away all the eyeballs from from their platforms, because at the end of the day, you got to remember these media companies, their businesses, they may be state sponsored. Uh, so, you know, they scratch but, the, the state back. These lockdowns and things like that, they, they kind of made you and Rukshan, didn't they? I mean, Rukshan um, was a wedding photographer before that. And, and look, I, th- I think it depends what circles. I, before before COVID, you know, I was very involved in the in covering the Hong Kong protests. So in Hong Kong, we were superstars. But in Australia, in Australia and New Zealand and, and across the world when it came to the COVID narrative, yes, c- certainly um, it did. And and I don't think it's just me. I think also the mainstream media, they lo- that's what's so, to me, crazy that New Zealand's press got all this funding from the government to help them through COVID when COVID was the one time any media, didn't matter what side you were on, every media had the highest traffic Probably Ever. in in history. Yeah. Yes, uh, we certainly gained a lot of traffic, and we stole a lot of their potential traffic, and that's what they was. That's what the New Zealand press didn't want um, happening in New Zealand. But everybody was glued to their screens or their, you know, whatever. And they were crying device. poor. They were crying poor. And then, then, then when we get something like you coming here and the media are in lockstep with the government, and you know. That's what the Official Information Act documents showed in the in there, the cosy relationship between media, immigration, police, and the government in this whole story about you. It, it, it actually revealed an awful lot. I mean, they were quite familiar in their communications. It was quite revealing when we we got into their heads and saw them, their high, virtual high five, yay, we stopped them coming, you know, we did a good job there, boys, and... I wonder what those people who are high fiving that now think that you're coming here, you know, in August. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to be a fly on the wall, but it's it. You know, I think that those um, those internal communications showed so much and showed how corrupt your system is in New Zealand. The fact that there is this um, uh, unholy relationship between the media and the government and then on top of that how um institutions like the New Zealand immigration think that they're above the law and yeah. they dragged it out 
they dragged it out forever. That's the thing. Well, it's, it's almost a year, isn't it? It was uh-huh. almost a year. And the fact is they knew from day one that it was unlawful, that I did not meet the threshold. And we know they knew that because – we saw the internal communications yep. with the Australian Federal Police. So there was no grounds ever to stop me. I'm grateful that they did because this is so much more fun than coming <laughs> to that one silly, you know, uh, not silly. But you would that have been one. here for maybe 48 hours and yeah, there was made a, a couple of videos and flown home and that would there have been was the one, end of it. It was one protest that ended up being a bit of a fizzle um, and it, you know, I would have been in and out, run a few stories, and it would have been over and done with. Now, I get to come to Auckland and Wellington and, and you know, um, run book launches, and it's going to be so much more fun. Um, and and they're, they're going to be outraged by that because they turned something from me just telling other people's stories, which I'll probably still I'm, – I'm hoping to squeeze that in as well. But they, they turned it in – Turned it from just me telling other people's stories about general stuff in New Zealand. That Are you telling your story? To now me, t- they've given me the platform to tell my story. And ironically, based on all the lies, you know, I get to, t- to answer all the lies that the New Zealand Herald used without a byline, repeated without a byline in order to convince the government to ban me. That's the craziest part of all of this story. And remember, the New Zealand Herald started all of this in that initial article that was then used by the uh, in New Zealand immigration over the phone to tell me that that was the article they were just commenting. And then when we, when we look through their internal communicate communications, it was repeated time and time again, parts of that article. They're all the, all, they're, they're basically all the lies about me packed into one um, article, which was designed to pressure and not only pressure, but validate the government's um, decision to to ban me. And remember, the New Zealand Herald ran that article based on a rumour from no. Chantel Baker's telegram um, in order, again, like I said, to pressure the government, to pressure immigration, and also it's to to make the government know it's okay if 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 you ban him we'll support that decision that's yeah. really what it was it was a message to the government it was a signal yeah it was a signal do it and if you don't do it we're going to keep going on about all these things that you why you should have done it but if you do it we're going to be like yeah good on you and the government went with it and they helped each other they covered for each other patted each then, other on the back high fived each other and then fast forward to now where i've not only uh, you know, coming in to report on a, an event and they yeah. can't use my propensity to incite other pe- people with other views. That was the, you and know. You're coming to tell your story. I'm coming to tell my story that they don't want anyone to hear, hence their article without a byline. It, it, it It's, that is the biggest ad for this. Their article is what this, what my book and my story answers. It's the truth that they don't want you to hear. But suddenly the New Zealand Herald is so quiet. It's a bit like um, when when you revealed that into uh, that 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 leaked Interpol email um, after it was proven that it was when it was validated and it was authenticated. Suddenly, they all went silent. All the people that were so angry that you were making up something so outrageous. Well, when the yeah. outrageous thing ended up being true, That's suddenly right. they all went silent. And, and you would think that the New Zealand Herald would be above that, you know. Okay, you can still hate me, but hey, isn't it newsworthy? The guy that you were so outraged over a rumor that was coming is coming but, now. But they do that with me all the time, Marvi, because during the first lockdown we had in New Zealand, the same source that gave me the the memo, your memo, the Interpol memo, they gave me some internal documents that showed that Crown Law had advice, given advice to the police that the lockdown was illegal. Mm. And we we ran that, you know, very early on. And again, we were accused of making it up. Oh no, they made he's made it up. That's just not true. The, it's all legal. Stay at home, or we'll or we'll arrest you. But it was illegal. They had advice to say that what Ardern's regime had done in cahoots with the police 
was illegally lock us down, but they said that I made it up. And when it was no longer tenable to say that I made it up because I did an official information act request using the specific document code that was issued by <laughs> crown law. So now it was, Oh no, okay. You didn't make it up. Um, it's a draft. And so, uh. then they, so they went through that, but then there was a court case. There's one, you know, brave individual who took the government to court over these documents and proved that yes, the first lockdown was illegal and that what Cam Slater had written was true. But yeah. they but the media all went down, they, they didn't weren't interested in that. They were going down the narrative. But as you say, you know, you're coming back to New Zealand, you're gonna launch your book. Tell us about what that book's about, Avi. That's what people well, want to know, the, the, the real RV, isn't it? Well, that's what the book is. It's, you know, for years we've heard others tell you about me, including the New Zealand Herald, and they've always got these little talking points that they've cherry-picked from my life, some of them completely false, some of them completely out of context, you know, some of them some of them laughable. Um, but... It's the time has come. Well, I'm finally able to talk about it all. And I'm telling, I'm saying to it's people, everything though, isn't it, Avi? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you, it's my you, whole story. Yeah. You cover some, you know, pretty torrid things that have happened in your life. You know, your addiction to drugs, you know, the, the, the case that um, the media likes to bash you about, you know, where they try and call you a wife beater and all of those sorts of things. Everything. And even, I, yep. you know, even, you know, some of your younger years, how, how many, how many, ch how many children in your family were there, Avi? I'm one of 17. So yeah, I'm number 10 of 17. It, it's been a wild ride. And I think, um, so you've been fighting since, since you were born. <laughs> just for attention. <laughs> for attention. Yes, attention. Yeah, That's know. right. That's right. Um, I, I bet look, you learned to eat fast. Uh, I've, I've learned now to slow down, but yes, that's, it's funny you picked that one up because I get in, I got into a lot of trouble about that, um, about learning to slow down when I well, eat. It's interesting. I've got, a, I've got a, a, a mate of mine and he tells me about, you can tell somebody's upbringing by how they eat fish and chips. And, uh, he said, uh, if you were in a poor household and you were brought up with, you know, eating fish and chips. You always ate the chips first because there was always a piece of fish for everybody. Yeah. But if you ate your fish first, there was no chips left for you. <laughs> and so it's his little way of working out how people's upbringing. And that's why I touched on, I kind of picked that up from your book that you'd, you had to be quick in a family of 17. If you weren't quick, you're going to get hungry real fast. Yeah, look, I don't think you'd be hungry, but yes, you, you'd get, you'd go missing, or you won't get what. Uh, yeah, I, I think the fish and chip uh, story is probably a great example because that's that's the truth. Um, but it's funny, nobody's ever said that to me, and and it is a, a true fact that um, all of us eat super fast. <laughs> and uh, bless my wife, she's slowed me down, but. Um, yeah, I think that the whole book is a, I would call it a pretty brutally honest, um, story, you know, with all, warts and all it's, you know, not, not, as I say, not all of it's pretty, but it's the truth. And it's, it's not what they tell you about me. It's not, I think at the end of it, you realize it puts into context yeah, me and even all those horrible things you've heard about me it puts them into perspective and puts them in their right place those things that you know the complete helps, lies yeah it helps round out the who is Avi, what is Avi, what drives Avi. that's the impression that i got from reading your book is that here was a person who was driven from an early age and had some pretty serious challenges you know you were you were addicted to drugs um, you're probably running with the wrong crowd in Melbourne, and yet you saw an obligation or a duty to serve in the Israeli Defence Forces. It probably was 
from what I can read in the book, Avi, it looks like you were, that was like last chance saloon. I need to go and get straightened down and the idea for the ones who are going to do it. Is yeah, that pretty what? much. Yeah, it is. Um, I think, you know, it was a, it was a journey, but I th- there was two sides to it. I, I, obviously, it was something I always wanted to do. Um, why, why is that? Well, I think I had, firstly, my two older brothers and my cousins and my uncle who, you know, my uncle who passed away in the army. But it's a sense of duty, I think, as being um Jews in the safety of the West, in the safety of Australia, you always in the back of your mind, you think about especially when you have family, so much family there, you feel some sort of duty to help um protect them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on a personal level, of course, I knew I needed discipline in my life. And I had hit that rock bottom and I talk about the rock, you know, the day that I hit rock bottom. Yeah. And I knew that this is the time, um, this is going to make or break me. And I think, uh, I think, or, or I, I think I had a few of those moments in my but journey. But you didn't do it easy though, Avi, did you? I mean, you, you decided that you wanted to serve in the Galani Brigade. Well, like, that's, yeah, that's right. Because that's please. where all my family go. And if you're going to do things, I think, a constant theme through the book is not doing things in halves. So Mm. if I'm going to join the Israeli army, I'm going to join um, the Golani brigades. Yeah. I'm I'm not going to join, you know, I'm not going to go there and become a mechanic. Yeah. So you're a fighter. You joined, you're in the infantry. Absolutely. And and you're wound up in Gaza. In a Gaza, war. Well, I was, I was first uh, in the beginning of the, of my service, uh, I was in Lebanon yeah. Um. And then, but most of my uh, deployment was in the Gaza Strip. Yeah. But but again, you didn't even speak Hebrew, did you? Uh, very broken. So my Hebrew was uh, ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew. So it's a bit like if you think of somebody coming to New Zealand and speaking in Shakespeare English. Yeah. Trying yeah. trying to get around like that. That's how I must have sounded to. Um, Israelis, and I remember their faces. I'll tell you a story that's <laughs> not in the book. Is um, when when I, you know, I have lots of my lots of cousins there that are my age, and I remember when I got there, uh, I was hanging out with my cousin, a couple of my cousins, their sisters, and and their friends, and um, you know, it was probably the first week that I was in Israel, and the friends turned to their to my cousin. And said, you know, not not when I, the next day when I wasn't around, and said, oh, you know, they were talking about me, and essentially, it they thought that I was special, that I had some sort of learning difficulty or you, something because you, you kind of are special. Are yeah, <laughs> look, so that's why this story is probably not. That's why I never made the book because I am no, but the, <laughs> they thought I had some sort of learning difficulty or something. And that's why I was talking like that. And they didn't realize that I was just Australian. <laughs> just Australian. Because I, I look Israeli. And so they, you know, they didn't picture it. And then, you know, to them, an Aussie would be blue hair, blue eyes, blonde hair, white. Um, they, weren't, they weren't expecting someone that looked like my family, Yemen. And, and then on top of that, I was speaking ancient kind of Hebrew, which was really weird. Um, and so then it all clicked and it was, we all laughed about it um, over and over again. And they often make fun, made fun of me in the army. That's how I learned Hebrew is, you know, people mocking me, but that's, that's something I get, I, I guess through the book you also learn is that I like to have a laugh at everything, including myself. Yeah. And I, I've never been someone that gets uh, easily offended. So uh, the army days were fun. They, they, they mocked the hell out of me and my accent. Um, including- those those days in the army, this is just to put it in context, right? We're talking about here in 2005, 2006, aren't we? Yeah, 2005 to 2008, yeah. Yeah, so that's when the Israeli army were having to change a few things around because they'd rolled out the Makava tank, but found that in Lebanon they had a few issues 
with a few soldiers getting injured with those tanks. Yeah. Well, yeah, Lebanon was a was what we considered to be a failure, mm. um, a, a failed war. And again, to put that into perspective, for Israel, a failed war means you know oh. we lost a hundred and something, I think, whereas um, we took out ten times that. But but the being, objectives and goals weren't met in the end. weren't met, and you know Israel doesn't it, it, uh, because it's such a tiny state, and it's a it, we're fighting. You know we were fighting for existence to for our survival mm. it mm. doesn't matter if we lose a tenth that's not how the war should go so it was that was a, a, a not a great war for israel and um so there was a lot of training and i talk about that in the book as well mm. and um then gaza was it, it was right as the disengagement from gaza so right after uh israel Pulled out of Gaza. Pulled out of Gaza and gave it back to, to or gave it to the Palestinians to, uh, you know, it was land for peace under the under the promise of of peace and and all all Israel got was rockets and terror attacks, and that's when um, we were going in there. Like when I when when I first got to Israel, when the that disengagement from Israel happened, my cousins were living in Gaza. Uh, the disengagement from Gaza, so. My cousins were actually living in Gaza, and right. one of my cousins was a high-serving, high-ranking um, special forces police, so border police um, officer, and he, you know, he was kicked out of his own home, and so it was quite personal. And going yeah. in there and seeing what they did to the land that was given to them for peace. Well, the first thing they did was they it was Hamas versus Fatah, so they killed their own. Yep, and then they turned, and then once they were. Once they grabbed throw, control of they Gaza. were throwing them off buildings. Each side was throwing each other off buildings in Gaza. And then once Hamas took control of it, um, then they started targeting Israel. And that's where that's where I was stationed, and that's when I was stationed there. And it was a it was a crazy time. And and you actually saw combat. So you, yeah. you went in the rear with the gear. You were in there. In fact, in in, in the book, you describe one incident where you kind I of shot lost, myself. Yeah, you kind of lost your mind, and you, you your rifle didn't work, and it, it all locked up. But you carried on in that. I mean, I read that story, and I thought, "Wow, you know, I never knew that about you before." And um, to actually just press on, even though your rifle wasn't working anymore. Well, I don't think I had much of a choice. It was <laughs> that, or give up and get shot and die. But you know, I, I, I don't think. I think, yeah, it's. It's one of those things that a loud mouth little troublemaker like me thinks he's going to go some one way when it all hits. And it gets real, real so, fast. Oh, and it gets real, real fast. And suddenly my big mouth uh, was shut, <laughs> shut <laughs> real, real quickly. Uh, you uh, shut tight. Speechless by fear. Yeah, that, that was, that was, that would have been a, uh, a, a an honest headline for that scenario. But I guess it, like many things in my life, it put things into perspective and and it taught me so much and it made me who I am today. And yeah. whilst I'm not proud of every moment and every story, um, There's still, I'm, pretty um, ha I'm pretty happy how the work in progress known as Avi Yamini is going. God, who talks about themselves in third person? <laughs> But just just to round out the the story about Gaza and the military, you were a marksman, right? Yep. You 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 got additional training, better weapons, and you were a marksman. So yes. You, so you were learning to hit your target. Yeah. So yes, uh, when you say better weapons, I just it was better scopes. Really, yeah. it was a day and and a night scope, especially yeah. back then. I, I reckon today. I was I was just there. My nephew, my little nephew, I can't believe he he, he just finished the army and he was in Golani as well. Yeah. He was actually in my same thing. Um, the, I I, oh, I, I think most of them have now the the great gear, whereas in our days it was specific. So you know I'd get a Trigicon, yeah, an a M4, scope and and an M4 where, and then a, a big this huge night vision scope which. I reckon today they probably have it much smaller. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what were you asking? 
No, I was just I was just noting that you were a marksman. You weren't just oh, an, yeah. you weren't just an ordinary, you know, grunt. Uh, my, my, in- mind you, that that was the best job to have. I <laughs> yeah. I, to- I told my nephew, you know, you should you should go for that. Yeah, because um, well, if you don't, most of the other gear. Firstly, you see the most action. That's the yeah. that's the you know even when patrol, you're always the number one they call because yeah. you because you can have an accurate shot. So even if it's firing warning shots, they want an accuracy to ensure that you don't accidentally shoot someone. Yeah. Um. And and then also when it is a terrorist, you, you you're often the first person they call to um, yeah. neutralize them. So it is the best gig from, you know, quote unquote, an action point of view, but also the gear that you got to carry. So <laughs> the they call it a pakal. I don't know what it, I don't know what that actually translates. But your pakal is your job. So you know, yeah. if you're the, if you're the if you're the water man, you've got to carry all that water on your back. Yeah. But what? It doesn't give you more action. It just slows you down. If you're the radio man, yeah. So you've got. Yeah, to be if you're the machine manner. gunner, you've got extra. Yeah, machine gunner. And- the machine gunner has this huge machine gun, which is fun for the three minutes that he gets to fire away if he can <laughs> handle it. Um, but it is the worst piece of equipment to have to lug around. So the sharp the sharpshooter or the or the marksman has the best gig. Um yeah. it's nothing like a sniper. Snipers work on their own and it's sucks. I could never do that. I have too many ants in my pants. I would not yeah. be able to sit in a one position enough. for three days without um you know, killing my number two. So, in uh, Melbourne under Dictator Dan, it got pretty torrid there, didn't it? Uh, with, the, think, with the armed police and the... I think the world witnessed what happened there, and um, I think it's a it's a dark mark on our state's history. I don't think it'll be remembered as um, as Dan Andrews would like it to be remembered. You know, he, 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 I think he frames it as saved all the lives of everybody in Victoria. He was Same the as Jacinda Ardern. Yeah. He's the, he's the male Jacinda or I don't know. These days you can't assume they're either genders. But you would, needed bodyguards at that time, didn't you? At the protests? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we did. <laughs> we, I did for almost two reasons. I did because, Obviously, as you know, not everyone likes me. And I think those I of you who are me neither. I think my phone need to read my book just as much as, you know, there's, I actually think everyone does, except for the blind haters that are just, um, that it's, their hate for me is politically motivated. To say it is essentially that they hate my existence because I stand for everything they don't and they're just groomers. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But, I'm talking about the general public, uh, whether you like or dislike my politics or, um, you know, often uh, probably the people I want most to read it are those who liked some of my work. Um, you know, uh, people often walk up to me and say, Hey, I really, I really like some of the stuff you did. I don't agree with everything. I'm like, mate, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I go, what did I say yesterday? <laughs> so no, but yeah. The, the people that I want really most importantly to read it are those that follow my work that and um, they've been bombarded for years with negative uh, reporting about aspects in my life by people that are bad faith actors that have that have to be honest a lot of the people that originally started the reporting knew the bigger context of any story they were reporting, but they cherry pick parts that is easy yeah. to, to sell in a headline. Other year, many pleads guilty to assaulting ex-wife. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Spoiler alert. I did do that, but yeah. I did it. Um, I pled guilty to a crime that I didn't commit because I put my kids first, because as much as I knew that that was going to be the headline, I really wanted to see my kids. And while I had an open domestic violence matter, the I wasn't going to be able to get my kids. So I needed to close that matter by pleading guilty to a summary offence. Um, Doing what it the, takes, isn't it? It's like what you did uh, in, uh, uh, in Israel. In, absolutely. In I never, and, and if I had to go back in time, well, it depends how far back I could rewind. But if I could only get back to that point, 
I would do the same thing because guess what? My kids matter more to me and my relationship with my kids matters more to me and the well-being of my kids matters more to me than what you think of me because of some reporting from some journalist that um, hated my guts and found something they could weaponize in my life to, to bring me down. But what I would say to those people that have read that message or heard all those stories about me for so long and they're, they're in two minds, they think, oh, I really like some of the work he's done, but these stories sound horrible. Read my book and make up your own mind. It's, a bit, your- of a, it's a bit of a tearjerker in some parts, Harvey, you've got to say. You know, it it actually moved me, some of the things that you've written in that book. Well, I was being honest, and it's uh, that's the thing. Uh, I I know that there are parts in my life it was hard for me to write. Um, but I think when when you read it with an open heart and an open mind, you realize how horrible the the legacy media and and my detractors, those who knew and know better, you realize how horrible the whole system and how rigged it is that when they want to bring a person down, when they want to shoot the messenger, it's not that hard um, because everybody has stories in their lives that if you cherry picked half of it from somebody else, um, you can really paint somebody in a bad light. And that's what they've done. And in my case, they did it whilst I couldn't respond and they Mm. knew that. So they had free reign until now. And so now here's your uh, story. This is my story and it's yeah. in my words. And, and do you know what? Read my story and read their reporting again. And then I bet you'll have that little light bulb moment, that click where it goes. Now it all makes sense. Because- that, old, that old saying about you should walk a, a mile in your opponent's shoes to understand what, what they're about, you know? Yeah. But look, I also don't blame, I'm talking about that same group of people that, um, that have liked my work but felt like they couldn't uh, get past what they were being told about me because I'd never defended myself. So why the hell should they? Mm. But um, so I, I don't really blame people that have, have taken it, but I hope that this opens people's eyes to the fact that when the media is working so hard to ruin somebody's reputation, ask yourself why, and then ask yourself why that person isn't defending themselves because it, um, silence isn't necessarily an admission of guilt. No. Silence may be that because the person has no choice, especially on these sorts of issues. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't blame people that judged me based on, the stories they were told because they weren't given the other side of the story. Now I'm saying to them, read the other side of the story, make up your own mind. And I bet you, if you read the story and you read the entire story, because like I've said a few times in this discussion is I don't hide anything. I tell you the stuff that is, that um, may shock you. That's pretty horrific, but um, everything that they have, what, what I can guarantee is everything that they have told you about me is a complete lie. Yeah. And I'm well, none know, of the, I, I know exactly I, where you're coming from. I am, I am many, thing. I am many things. I'm just not what they say that I am. So let's just crunch that a little bit before we wrap up. Do you think it's possible that these attacks on you by the mainstream media come out of a form of embarrassment that during this time of COVID in particular, they lay down and didn't stand up for the people. I, look, I think it's just a tool to discredit me. They've done it even before COVID. You know, the Jewish Nazi thing was before COVID. Mm. It, it, there's always been something. Uh, I think when that story with my ex-wife, um, when that played out, they found the perfect thing that they could use that I couldn't answer. Yeah, no one likes a wife ju- beef, do they? Yeah. No, but nobody <laughs> does. And um, guess what? I, I that, that, that was probably the one that stung. It definitely stung the most. One, because I couldn't answer it. But two, because it's so false. And three, I hate wife beaters more than most people. Um, 
and and it's and it's funny because often these people that are uh, are, are um, social justice warriors behind their you're so brave behind their screens. You know, I, I'm often the one that will confront uh, violent people directly with a camera in their face. These people, they're so brave at home. You know, mm. but it's, uh, disseminating lies about just a political rival. They don't care about my ex-wife. They don't care. I don't care about anything. They, they just want to demonize. They you. go. Yeah, they want to demonize me. They, they they don't care about my kids. The, I, I have the most beautiful kids, and you know the stuff that they say about me will hurt my kids. <laughs> they, don't they don't care. care. <laughs> they don't care about any of that. This was always been to just discredit me at, uh, at any cost, and you know that's why I'm excited about this because I'm reclaiming my own story. Yeah. Um for the for the first time i'm getting to tell people to set the record straight that's why it's called a rebel from the start because that when you read the book you'll learn that from day one from birth i was a rebel but it is setting the record straight and those little lies are only a few pages of the book that's the funny thing yes i I keep doing interviews and and it it becomes about that but it's not the whole book is really not about those no, things. No, it's it's completely it's really fascinating and, and like I, I read it from cover to cover in one go. Uh you know, I just sat there and read it and I just thought, wow. I don't I don't know if I should take that as a as a, as a compliment or <laughs> it, it sounds like a grade six. I couldn't I couldn't put it down. I, I couldn't put it down Abby. So how do people get this book? Rebelfromthestart.com. You can get the book there. You can also sign up to the book tour that is launching in New Zealand first, the censorship capital of the world. Yes, I said it. And if you're going to do the next obvious thing that some of you have done and cry about me calling it the censorship capital of the world because you think North Korea is worse, okay, you win. North Korea is worse. The difference is they don't pretend not to be. Yeah, they're not pretending to be kind. So... So when are you capital- coming here, Avi? Your fans are uh, are really 20- looking forward to seeing you. I hope so. I'm looking forward to seeing them. 25th of August in Auckland, 26th in Wellington, um, and then other dates in other places will be not not in New Zealand. So I think Melbourne will probably do on the Monday after that. But I hope to see and you know as many of you guys as possible. I'm sorry I can't get around. The entire, you know, the other island, but I know some people have said it's quite expensive to get there. I I would come. I just at this stage it's it's impossible. So I'd love to see for those of you that can make it, come. I'll uh, I'll sign the book if you want. I find that a bit funny. Have we have we funny. got the have we got any other news that we can tell? You? Is 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 it confirmed about the rebel commander? The rebel command is coming. Yeah, you can break that here. Yeah, Ezra so Levant is Ezra coming. Levant is coming to New Zealand as well. So if you're going to go to these events, you're going to get a twofer. Yeah, you're going uh, to get. Yeah, Ezra's probably better than me. So that's <laughs> you're going to get that's Ezra, uh, you know, uh, and Arby, and and I'll be there at the book launches, of course. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you here, Arby. Finally, uh, thumbing your nose at immigration and the police on the way through. And Chanel Lell, who will no doubt be outside crying about something. Um, but unlike with Posey Parker, he's not going to chase anyone out. Um, and, uh, you know, that there'll be nice, safe events. So you don't have to worry. It's not going to be, be a replay of what happened there. This is going to be well organized um, with everybody's safety in mind. Um, and, yeah, I re- rebelfromthestart.com, get the book, read it. And then bring it on the day, and if you want me to, I'll sign it. I've, I, I do feel a bit awkward about that at the moment because I, I, people are asking me, and people that I actually look up to are making me sign their books, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna know. make you, I'm gonna make you sign mine, Abby, because lucky I'm I don't not, look up I'm, to you. I'm not in the book. You put, <laughs> you put Chantel Baker in the book, but you didn't put me in the book. So I, it's true. I I, I was uh, when we were talking. Now I got a bit embarrassed, thinking, oh, I didn't actually because we talk. I talk about the things you did yeah but i didn't name you but it's all right i'm not after glory i'm just after the end result which is until baker i put in the book because she she screwed my life <laughs> i was well, outing her mind you i'm doing a podcast with her in melbourne tonight she's in melbourne all right good 
Thank you so much for coming on uh, my first show, Avi. I really appreciate it. I feel it. honored that I was actually your first show. When you told me I'm going to be the first show, I was thinking it, it's a good move because it can only go uphill from here. Yeah, you, you popped my cherry, so to speak. Yeah, but <laughs> you can have the worst episode next week and it'll still be better than this one. <laughs> I don't know about that, Avi. Look, I'm looking forward to seeing you when you come back into the country. Me too, mate. Thank you for coming on The Crunch with Cam, and uh, we'll catch up in August. We definitely will. Don't worry about that. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.